everyone. So welcome to this session on Unity Game Server Hosting and Matchmaker. So to kick off, we'll do a, a short introduction. So my name's Dan. I'm a staff software engineer for the Game Server Hosting team here at Multiplace. I'll be talking a little bit today alongside my colleagues. We've got uh, Gladys, who is a senior product manager for Matchmaker. And we've also got Galal, who is a senior software developer for the Matchmaker team also. We've also got a few other folks from the Unity side sat answering the QA questions. Um, so if you do have questions or uh, input on anything we talk about today, please use the Zoom QA feature for that. Um, that allows us to answer those questions a little bit better than we could do in the chat. So if you do have a question, please throw it into uh, Q&A. And I see there's a couple of questions in there already, which is great to see. So what we're going to be covering today is, uh, as I say, matchmaker and game server hosting. So on the game server hosting side, we're going to be talking about what is Unity Game Server Hosting? What is that service offering to uh, to you as Unity customers? Uh, the new self-service offering we have there. We're going to talk about software development kit. Uh, we're going to be talking about containers uh, also. On the matchmaker side, we'll be talking about what is matchmaking, what are the uh, sort of concepts there, so tickets, queues, and pools. We'll be having a bit of a getting started tutorial on uh, on both of those services as well, and then we'll round it off with a live Q and A with our in-house experts uh, and. Uh, sort of being able to ask anything that you want to know from them. Um, the session today is uh, scheduled for about an hour in total, so we'll have uh, a good amount of time at the end for the Q&A also. So first up, let's talk about game server hosting. So the success of your game shouldn't depend on your team needing to have infrastructure or server scaling experience. Now, this is what Unity Game Server Hosting is designed to solve for. Now, this service has formerly been known as Multiplay. So a few of you may have heard of that feature before or that product before. And this is a battle tested platform. So we've worked with studios such as uh, Respawn uh, to work on their titles like Apex Legends. We've also worked with uh, another other titles such as uh, Overcooked, for example. And uh, Multiplay has been there to get those games through their launch phase and support them with uh, reliable server availability, on-demand scaling, and cost optimization. Now, Multiplay is an engine agnostic platform, uh, and it's going to stay that way. So we're uh, we're in the business to provide a great developer experience, irrespective of what game engine uh, your game is built on. So whether that's Unity or Unreal or a custom engine. Uh, and similarly, that goes for the platforms on which your players are playing those games, whether it's a PC game, console, uh, mobile, mod the multiplayer platform is here to make that work for you. Uh, we've taken those years of experience and the, the proven hosting technology, and we're bringing that to your fingertips with the uh, new suite of developer focused features. So let's just pull back for one second and have a look at how multiplayer fits into the wider set of Unity gaming services. So Unity Gaming Services, or UGS, it, it solves the developer challenges of building live games with tools for multiplayer services, game operations, user acquisition, and monetization also. So we've got a few different pillars uh, that make up UGS. So the developer and live operations services let you build and manage your game, while growth and monetization allow you to grow your player base and optimize your advertising and purchases. Now, the multiplayer pillar here in the middle is everything you need to build and operate your multiplayer game at scale. Now, Netcode is going to handle the, the mid-level network challenges for, for Unity. Uh, Relay is uh, solving for your peer-to-peer -peer gaming. Uh, Lobby helps you discover game sessions. Vivox solves your voice chat. But today, we're talking about game server hosting and matchmaker. Now, those are two powerful and tightly integrated services that enable you to host and operate immersive visceral multiplayer games with uh, self-service onboarding, uh, engine agnostic APIs, and uh, battle-tested performance, as I said already. So what's new on the multiplayer side? And as I've said, it's it's an established platform. Um, we've been successful for a number of years with, uh, with some big studios and some big titles. But what we want to do is democratize that and take those years of experience in the industry uh, and allow anybody to get started with dedicated game servers. So we developed a brand new API-driven onboarding flow with a, a powerful user interface in the Unity dashboard to get your game server uploaded, configured, and running. Uh, and of, of these uh, other headline new features, we've shipped a software development kit 
Uh, we've shipped that for, for Unity already. Uh, the similar software development kit for Unreal is in the works uh, and should be released relatively soon also. So that SDK can be dropped into your game server runtime and allows you to get up and running with multiplayer and only a few lines of code. Uh, we've also made the flow of shipping your game server to multiplayer even simpler with support for container images. Uh, and that allows you to bring your game server and all of its dependencies together and ship it to multiplayer in one fell swoop. So we'll dig more into this a little bit later, but suffice to say, containers are just one of the ways you can ship your game server build to multiplayer. Um, if you're not invested in the container ecosystem, we have you covered also with other methods or more traditional methods, but we'll dig into that a little bit more shortly. So first up on the new features, I want to dive into the SDK, first of all. So as I say, we've shipped a game server SDK. Now this is a package that integrates your game server with the multiplayer backend, and it's a, a drop-in replacement for uh, previously having to write a lot of bootstrap code yourself. So in the past, if you wanted to come along and use multiplayer um, and you were maybe on a, an engine we didn't have sample code for, or uh, uh, something a bit more custom, you had to write that bootstrap code yourself. Uh, and that was even the case for, for a lot of Unity and uh, Unreal users as well. Now this new SDK, it's, it's a drop-in package and you only really have to install the package with your engine's package manager and do the small amount of plumbing to actually you know, use that package ultimately in your custom scripting in your C Sharp or C++. But ultimately the headline features of this are going to allow you to ship metrics on your game state uh, and know when your server has been allocated and can interact with a matchmaker. So as you can see from the diagram here, a matchmaker will fire in an allocation request to the multiplayer API, which will say, I want a game server in a particular region. Uh, the multiplayer API will interface with your game server code via the SDK and say, hey, I'm allocated, you need to start a match. And then your game server can use the same SDK code to then ship metrics on how many players do you have, my, when's your match, starting what's your map name that sort of thing uh, and as i called out earlier on the first version of this sdk will uh, support unity with unreal following soon after uh, and that's part of the ongoing commitment to build a engine agnostic platform and the sdk will ship with feature parity uh, on both of those uh, unity and unreal versions so next up as i mentioned earlier was containers so Containers have been popular in the world of web services for a number of years. Uh, and the reasons for that are it allows a standardization of packaging. Um, they're really easy to distribute and you have consistent behavior where your container is running. So the, the theory there being, if you're running that game server on your local machine or on a test game server on multiplayer, you'll get easy, consistent, replicatable behavior. So it's this mentality of build once, deploy everywhere. Uh, containers allow you to package your game server runtime and all of the dependencies together in a single artifact and push that to the container registry. So if you need a particular library or some dependency on the operating system for your game to run, uh, you can ship that in, in one chunk together with your own assets. So you just need to choose a base operating system, add your game binary and configuration uh, and ship that to multiplayer. Again, it's completely agnostic of engine. If your game can run on Linux, uh, or later on down the line, Windows support when that comes into play, uh, it'll work here too. Multiplayer will allow you to roll out the latest version of your container image uh, with zero downtime to your fleet of game servers. As I said earlier, worth calling out that we're not going to drop support for other methods um, such as file upload with the with the API or via the user interface. Those are still going to be supported and they're still going to work great for you if you're not invested in that container ecosystem. So no pressure to use that if you absolutely don't need to. Ultimately, upload the server build files direct to multiplayer and the platform does the rest of the heavy lifting for packaging and distributing to machines around the world wherever you need to run game servers. So what we're gonna do now is run through a little video guide of how this looks in practice. So this is in the new user interface. I've gone through the steps of signing up for the Unity dashboard and creating a project. Uh, we have a free credit system here, so it's worth calling that out. You can get up and running and uh, test your game servers without any uh, initial cost. Um, there's going to be a credit system there around eight, around about $800 lasting uh, six months. So if you do want to get into that world, you're able to do so. So the first thing to do is to integrate our game server. 
so this is a uh, help guide to help guide you through that initial sort of setup phase. You can choose the engine in which your game's been built. Uh, in this case, we're going to choose uh, Unity, Unreal, and the custom engine support is grayed out here at the moment, but that will be enabled in future. And what that's going to do is it gives us instructions on how to install the SDK. So it's going to say, actually, first of all, it's going to tell us how to link our Unity project to your uh, editor. So actually linking your Unity dashboard project to your local Unity editor. Then we get the instructions on how to install the SDK. And right now, you need to install that by name, uh, com.unity.services.multiplay. You can reference this in the docs a bit later. Next up is we need to create a build. Now, a build is the wrapper or your executable. That's your config files, your assets. Um, anything that really makes up your, your game server. Now, we recommend that you have multiple builds um, within your single Unity project. Ideally, you have at least two of those, an A image, an A build, and a B build. And what that allows you to do is switch dynamically between those two versions for things like zero downtime patching. One is the active version, one is the development version, let's say. So you can iterate on one while another one is running game servers. So in this case, um, I'm using the direct file upload method. So I've upload, uh, uploaded all my game server assets. We're going to speed uh, this up in a moment because we don't want to watch 500 megabytes of files upload in real time. So just for the sake of brevity, we're going to fast forward this and we've got our files uploaded. And ultimately what that means is that we can now take those files and start packaging them up to use to create game servers. Worth noting that if you look at our public roadmap, we've also got um, support on the roadmap there for syncing from, from external storage buckets such as uh, S, uh, Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage. So that's uh, on the future roadmap as well. So there'll be many ways in which you can get your files from your build pipeline into the multiplayer world. And once we've got a build, the next thing to do is we need to tell multiplayer how to run it. So a build configuration is really what that piece is. So a build configuration defines how your build will run, what are the arguments you need to start the process, what are the configuration files, how much resource does it need to run. And similarly, we recommend you have at least two of these to match with your A build and your B build. And the reason for that is that's how a matchmaker will tell Multiplay what version of your game it wants to run. I want a game running this build configuration in this region. And that really is how you're going to power your patching of your game servers. So you can have your matchmaker switch the build config it uses dynamically to say, okay, now I want to move over to my B build while my A build is drained away and I can use the A build to do updates on and then vice versa. So in this case, I've given it a name, I've chosen the build uh, and you can see there, I just was able to choose the executable from the dropdown list as so auto-populated from the files we uploaded. And then we're looking at query. Now query, as I said earlier, is how you expose metrics to multiplay from uh, your game server, number of players, map information, that kind of thing. And we have a number of protocols here. So there's SQP, which is the multiplayer in-house protocol. There is A2S, which is the one developed by uh, Valve and the Steam SDK. And equally, you can have no protocol at all. SQP is a great choice for Unity and Unreal because it's baked into the multiplayer SDK. Literally just install the SDK to your package, to your project, and it will do all the heavy lifting for you. You just need to update the state when a player joins, when a player leaves, that kind of thing. The documentation is very good on this, um, but it's a good choice if you want to go down that route. And then the next one is the launch parameters. Now, this is really the uh, literal arguments to your process where you need to start it. So in this case, I've copy and pasted in some uh, that I made earlier. Pretty familiar for any Unity users. So there's no graphics, batch mode, um, just to make sure we're starting it headless so we're not so we're running a server version, not a, a desktop version. And the remainder of these flags are specific to this sample game that I'm working with. So I'm enabling query, I'm setting it into a dedicated server mode, setting the maximum frames per second, um, and also some things like exposing the log directory also. You'll see some elements in there that are surrounded by dollar signs. Now, those are variable substitution. And those will be evaluated when the game server starts. So dollar dollar port will be evaluated to the actual network port that your server needs to bind onto, for example. Again, this is really well documented, but it's another dynamic feature that Multiplay is going to offer you there. And the last up here is the usage settings. Now, usage settings is super important for 
A, performance, and uh, B, cost control also. So really, this is telling Multiplay how much CPU, how much memory does my game server need uh, to run efficiently. Uh, and ultimately, this isn't for limitation. It's for, as I say, cost control and for server placement. By knowing how much game server you use, how much resource your game server uses at its peak, we can make a good decision on the number of servers we can place on a single machine. Uh, and the more machines you have online at any given time, that is sort of going to increase the number of CPUs you're using, the amount of memory you're using, so ultimately the amount of cost you're using. So it's really important to get those settings accurate. Um, and when I say peak usage, what I mean by that is when your server has the most players. So if you're a battle royale, your game server is going to use more resource at the start of the game so that you really want to benchmark it at that point and use that to configure your usage settings. And then lastly, what we're doing here is creating a fleet. Now, a fleet is really the thing that ties everything together. It's your presence of game servers across the world. So what I've done here is I selected the build configuration that we set up earlier. Um, I'm choosing the Europe region. Uh, there's a number of preloaded regions in here that you can select from. There is Europe, North America, South America, uh, Asia also. Uh, and then we need to set our minimum servers and our maximum servers. Now, again, these are really important for cost control and also for availability of your game servers. We need to find a good balance here between how many servers do I have available to host new matches and what are my maximum servers I want for uh, controlling the ultimate amount of scaling. So think about this in terms of an availability buffer. When your players are loading up your game, they hit the quick play button. You don't want your players sat stuck watching a matchmaking screen for a long time, right? They're going to get frustrated. They may drop. So you want a, enough servers available at any given time to handle the amount of incoming players you've got. So that's your minimum available servers. That's your buffer. But equally, Maybe you're just rolling out your game for a test or you're conscious of costs in a particular region. That's why maximum servers exist. So you can limit the amount of servers you can have running so they don't just fully run away. So to recap, we've got a build, we've got a build configuration, and we've got a fleet. So we're now in a pretty good place to start running our game servers in earnest. So the last thing in the setup guide is called a test allocation. And we're just going to go and double check that the build is all set up. So what we can see here is we have the build. It's got the first version. It set the operating system correctly, as we would have expected. All the files are existing. The version history panel here is going to show us uh, any uh, updates between the versions of the images that we make. Build configuration is set up also. We can see our launch parameters, our usage settings, and we can jump back in and edit all of this at any time. It's not a, a read-only view, so we've got full, full ability to edit builds, edit build configs, edit fleets on the fly. Um, we can add new regions. We can scale down individual regions at click of a button, so some really powerful ways to control your spread of game servers. Uh, and equally, the, the availability settings. We can set the mins. We can set the maxes on demand here also. And what we're going to do next is we are going to set up a, a test allocation. Uh, what a test allocation does is it's going to validate that our game server is working end to end effectively. So if we jump back to the setup guide, we will create a test allocation. And what that's going to do is it's going to effectively mimic what a matchmaker would do. So the reason for that being is we can validate that a, our game server has been set up correctly. We can set, check the files uploaded. We can check the build configuration is correct. And we're going to run this test. And what that's resulted in is we've got an IP address and we've got a port and an allocation ID. And this proves the fact that multiplayer was able to take your game server. It was able to start the process uh, and actually mimic the process of starting a real match. Now, the test allocation has a default timeout of one hour. So within that time frame, that server is going to stay running. You can connect it to a test game client, uh, or you could just manually spin it down again. So it's effectively uh, just started a, a match with a given time frame. Is a way to think about that. So there's a number of things we can do next. We can start integrating a matchmaker, which you'll see a little bit later in today's session. Um, or equally, we can go and have a look at the servers themselves. So we can see now the server we created with the test allocation is now ready. We can see it's got the IP in the port, it's marked as allocated. And we can see from our event log that it started up using the build configuration that we set up earlier. And this event log is going to store all the major events when you started, when you stopped, when you allocated. And we can also get the raw log output from the game server itself.
Cool. So now we've got a server running. I'm going to jump over to my editor. And what we're going to do here is we're going to start up the game and we're going to connect to the server that we just created. So we can think of this as a manual play test, if you will. So we're just going to configure some of the settings so it runs a little bit better in play mode. Uh, and this is the BR200 sample that you may have seen uh, on the Unity Asset Store right now. So this is available from today uh, and uh, or available today, I should say. It's been available for a number of weeks, but ultimately this is a 200 player battle royale. So what we saw in the server browser was the server we started on Multiplay had registered itself. And we are now able to actually get in, join the game and start testing on a real Multiplay server. And from the server's view back in the dashboard, we can actually now see that the stats are reporting one concurrent player. And that's because that game server was using the Multiplay SDK. It was sending query metrics back to the game server, sorry, back to Multiplay from the game server. And we're able to start querying that. We're able to start visualizing it, getting some real insights into the operation of our game server. Uh, and so that's basically there we are. We can jump back to the editor now. We can stop the uh, stop the client. Game server is going to become deallocated in the back end. And what we've done there is we've proven we've been able to go end to end from uploading the game server to actually having a match running connected to a real game client in what have what is really just a few minutes aside from the upload time. So really powerful, really exciting stuff there. And ultimately, this is the same technology we've used to launch titles like Apex Legends, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, Overcooked and some other titles uh, also. So really powerful, proven technology. But what do we want to do if we want to reach players en masse? So we're in a really good place to run those game servers. We want to be able to make that available to group players together, to give them a fun and a fair gameplay experience. Uh, and what you need to do that is you need a matchmaker. And Unity Game Server Hosting is going to work with any matchmaker. We have customers rolling their own solutions to great success. But Unity Matchmaker is a fantastic choice because it's integrated out of the box. It is battle tested and it provides players with, with awesome experiences. So I'm going to hand over now to Galal, who's going to tell you more about how Unity Matchmaker works. Thanks, Dan. All right. So be, before we talk about the Unity Matchmaker, let's first go over what a matchmaker is. Now, in, in simple terms, a matchmaker just puts players together into a game based on predetermined logic. Uh, you want to join a game server, multiple players want to join a game server. Um, so then if you, if you just, uh, yeah, so we have a player that wants to play a game and uh, a few other players that want to play a game um, and they, they all request a match from the matchmaker. And what the matchmaker does then is that it finds the best server by allocating on multiplayer and it tells them, okay, well, you guys are going to play on IP, uh, what, this IP and this port. So uh, let's let's take a look at how, uh, like a, a bit more of an in-depth example with multiplay. Um, now, next slide, please. So again, we have these four players, they want to play a match. Uh, so what they say is that, okay, Unity Matchmaker, uh, we're going to create a matchmaking ticket, which basically says, we want to play a game together. And then the matchmaking ticket it includes all of the information regarding their skill, their uh, player preferences, map preferences, uh, any information you want to add there, it's, it's completely custom. Matchmaker takes in this information and then uh, it puts these tickets together into a match. So it sees ticket from player A, player B, player C, player D, all of these tickets, uh, it runs some custom logic that you guys can uh, uh, define uh, using rules. And then it would say, okay, now I know that these four players are going to play together. Uh, I'm going to request a game server from, from multiplayer. Uh, so once, once the matchmaker finds a match, a suitable match, it, it requests a game server from multiplayer, which then uh, starts booting up a game server. Uh, it allocates, right? So requests a game server, that's the allocation request. And then multiplayer, as, as we've seen in the example earlier by Dan, it would allocate a server um, let's say game server one, which has an IP and port, and then it responds to the matchmaker with this information. So now matchmaker has put players together into a uh, allocation request. It told multiplay it needs a server. Multiplay responds back with the information, the allocation information, which again includes the allocation uh, ID, IP, and port. Then matchmaker takes this information and updates the tickets that we've originally received from the players. 
we add the server info to these tickets and then the players would be able to keep pulling for the ticket status and then they would see the IP and port. So yeah, the, the players would pull for the ticket status until, until they see the assignment. And the assignment, uh, then if, if one more slide, the assignment would say, you guys would need to connect to this IP and port. And then from there, matchmaker disappears out of the picture and the players now have a direct connection or they can directly connect to the game server that's hosted on multiplayer. So the matchmaker basically just puts these players together into a match, requests the, the, the game server from multiplayer and then tells them this is the IP and port that you guys need to connect to. All right, so I, I've mentioned tickets uh, earlier and tickets again is, is what a client or a game client or a player would create on the matchmaker to request a match. Uh, these tickets would all go into what we call ticket buckets. And ticket buckets are a way to dynamically partition the tickets. So let's say, for example, we have a thousand players and you have five game modes. You can create a, a bucket for each game mode, for each uh, different skill level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A ticket bucket consists of a queue and a pool. A queue is the physical separation of tickets. So this is where tickets would have to go and they cannot overlap. And pools are a logical separation of tickets that are inside a queue. So you take a queue, you subdivide it into multiple pools, and then these pools would have some filters to decide which pool we're going to join. And a queue plus pool would create a ticket bucket. Now let's take a look at a quick example of this. If we have a, a again, a ticket bucket consists of a queue and a pool, and this is completely develop, develop, developer defined through configurations. And we're gonna see a quick example in a video uh, shortly, uh, but then next slide, please. So now let's say we have configured these four buckets uh, for a game that has two modes, one uh, V one, and then a ranked mode. Uh, we also have two versions for the game. There is version 1.1, which is live. And then we have a beta version 1.2. We don't want our players to join, like all the players that are currently live to join 1.2 unless they have the 1.2 client. So what we can do here is that uh, when a ticket comes in, uh, when a matchmaker ticket comes in, uh, next slide then, uh, it would have information like which queue it wants to join and then it would have attributes saying the version I'm running right now for the client is 1.2 beta. What, what would happen here is that the matchmaker would now see and this becomes a bucket consisting of a queue and the pool that says, I'm gonna put this into queue 1v1, 1.2 beta. And then next ticket comes in, uh, and this one says, I'm, I'm, I want to join the rank queue, and I'm running version 1.1. So this goes to the ranked 1.1. Third ticket comes in, and that's ranked, and that says version 1.2 beta, so it goes to that bucket. And then the next one comes in, uh, and that, that one goes to the 1v1, 1.1 bucket. Now, we've seen now we have four tickets. None of them can play with each other because they, they're targeting different queues, different pools. Uh, however, ticket five comes in and it says I want to play ranked and uh, version 1.2 beta. So now this bucket would have these two tickets, tickets three, ticket five. And from there, we can uh, the matchmaker can find the matchmaker. All right, so that's, that's a quick uh, rundown of some of the core concepts. I'm going to hand it over to Gladys and uh, she's going to walk us through the Unity matchmaker features. Um, and we're going to take a look at how we can quickly set up a matchmaker after. Um, hello everyone, I'm Gladys, product manager of the Unity Matchmaker Solution. Thanks Galel for the nice intro matchmaker. Now let's take a look at uh, what our Unity Matchmaker is capable of and how it can benefit you. So our Matchmaker is a flexible solution that lets you match the right players in the right place in the right amount of time. And here are a few things that our Matchmaker offers. Firstly, the user-friendly UI for you to get started quickly. Our matchmaker is closely integrated with the game server hosting solution to offer a streamlined workflow on the Unity dashboard. You can create the matchmaking rules easily through the queues and pool system on the dashboard without any code changes. Also, we have matchmaker SDK available, um, so it makes it super easy to implement our solution. It gives you access to a great range of features, including the core matchmaking capabilities, um, quality of service, and authentication. Our matchmaker is also designed to scale, so you don't need to worry about how many tickets the matchmaker can handle because our solution 
can support an unlimited number of kids and pools. We understand every game is unique. That's why we also build a flexible root-based engine in Matchmaker to make sure our service can support your game loop logic. And most importantly, Matchmaker works with game server hosting out of the box. So that means once you have the hosting solution set up, you can start configuring the matchmaking system for a game right away. So what do these features mean to you? That means you can easily get started with the simple queue and pool system on Matchmaker, or you can go advanced with um, the configurable filters for Matchmaker as well. Um, we have the rule-based engine provided to you to make sure you have complete control on the Matchmaker configuration. And also the game server hosting solution will give you the scalability you need to grow your game. There are some features on Matchmaker like um, back view that ensures you can put players to ongoing matches. So players don't need to wait for new matches to start. And you can also configure a Matchmaker through SDK or API without worrying about if Matchmaker works with the game engine you're using. So there are tons of things you can do on Matchmaker and um, our flexible solution will be able to support your needs. Um, going to the next one, we want to show you how easy it is to set up Matchmaker for a project. So uh, I'm going to pass the mic back to Galel to talk about the setup steps. Thanks, Gladys. And we're going to go over a quick video of how we can set up a Matchmaker. Um, so first thing we want to do is once we have our multiplay uh, fleet set up and everything complete, we've uploaded the game server, uh, now we can integrate the matchmaker. Uh, whether you're using Unity, Unreal, or even a custom engine, there's an option for you. Uh, if you're using Unity, you can use an SDK. If you're using Unreal, uh, an SDK is coming soon, but you can now implement the API. If your engine is custom, you can implement the uh, through the API directly. And the API documentation is available. Uh, we're using open API spec, so it's it's really easy to use. Uh, next, we can link our Unity project, and you can install the Matchmaker package directly from the Unity uh, package manager within the editor. Next step is to create a queue. We've uh, briefly talked about what queues are, and again, queues are a way to separate the tickets into different physical uh, divisions. And what we want to do here is we're, we're just going to start with a quick example, let's say a deathmatch. Uh, game mode, and that's going to be a deathmatch queue. And here we can specify how many players we can put on a ticket maximum, right? So a ticket can include multiple players. If let's say a lobby has four players and you want to uh, four players create play together, you can set the the maximum here to four. Next step is to create a default pool, and this is going to be the the very first pool in the queue that we just created. I'm just going to call it here default pool. And here we have a timeout. Uh, the timeout here would say, if a ticket does not find a, a suitable match within 60 seconds, I'm just gonna time it out. Then I'm gonna select my multiplay fleet that I set up and I'm gonna select one of my build configurations. Now, this is where I define my matchmaking logic and that's the rules. Uh, again, this is a deathmatch uh, queue. So I'm, I'm just gonna call it deathmatch for now. I'm going to select US East as my uh, cost region. And this is, again, set up on multiplay. Uh, next, uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to set backfill to false and collapse everything so we have a better view of our match definition. Uh, let's start with the team definition first. In the match, we're going to define one or more teams. Uh, in this example, I'm just going to do a battle royale. So I'm going to call the team all. There's only a single team all. So it's min one, max one for the team count. Uh, for players, I want to say a minimum 50 players and a maximum 60 players to start a match. I don't want to start my match before I have 50 players. However, I can have a relaxation that would replace this 50 minimum uh, to something different after 30 seconds. So I'm, I'm going to say 20 uh, after 30 seconds. So if, if after 20 seconds, uh, sorry, 30 seconds, we can't find a match, we're going to start the match with 20 players. I can even add another one that says, okay, well, I'm gonna start at five players if, if we couldn't find a match for 60 seconds. And this applies to the ticket age being the oldest. So the oldest ticket that we have in the bucket right now has been waiting for 60 seconds. We're gonna collapse this so it's easier to see. And now we can look at rules. So 
rules here, we have team level rules and match level rules. Uh, however, since we have a single team, that there is not much of a difference between the team level rules and match level rules here. However, in general, match level rules apply to the whole match, all the players in the match, but team level rules would only apply to this type of team, um, which is, in this case, a single team called team all. I'm going to create a skill rule here, and we have multiple different type of rules that we can use, but what I want to do here is that I want to ensure that the difference between skill and all the players is within a certain number, within a certain range. So I'm going to say the source of the data is the data in all the players that we have. And uh, again, this is custom. Whatever you put in the ticket would be picked up here. And what I have in my ticket is a data path called skill. So I'm going to put that. And because this is a difference rule, we can't really uh, select any other data type. It would have to be a number. Right. Uh, and my reference here is going to be 50. So what I'm trying to say here is that I want to make sure that all the players that join this team uh, are within 50 skill points of each other. Then I'm going to say, OK, well, after 60 seconds, if we can't find a match, let's just disable this rule altogether. Uh, let's not enforce this rule. Right. Uh, one other thing we can do is that, OK, well, maybe after uh, after a different uh, some time not finding a match, maybe we want to change the 50 difference to 250. So what this would say is that, okay, well, after waiting for 30 seconds, I'm going to have a difference of 250. I'm going to allow a difference of 250 in the skill. And we have different type of age types. There's oldest ticket, youngest ticket, and average ticket age. Uh, so you can pick whatever is more suitable for your, um, for your game and, and your rule uh, or matchmaking logic. So we can add as many rules as we want, but once we're done, we can actually switch to a JSON view. And this gives you the, the, the configuration or the rules configuration here in JSON. And what you can do is really cool. You can just copy part of it and then paste it again and change a single number. And then this allows you to just go back into the, to, into the logic builder and see everything reflected there. Uh, so this could be an easier way to build your rules. If you have a rule in a different pool, you want to copy it, you can copy the whole, uh, the whole rule set and copy it over to, to a different pool. Uh, and you can see here, the third relaxation that we just created now says, uh, after 30 seconds, I'm going to change this to, to 100 uh, in difference. Now, once we've created the default pool, we don't really need to, to do anything else. We can start creating a match and, and put players together. However, we can also create what we call an additional pool. Additional pools uh, are a bit different from the regular pools, as in here they need filters. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is just beta players. Uh, I'm going to select the same fleet, but I'm going to select a different build. The, the second build configuration here uh, is a configuration that not all clients want, would want to join into. And this, this is the new view here for this pool. So filters is where I'm going to say, OK, the, for this pool, I only want to accept tickets that come in that have an attribute called build version. And this the value of this field is beta 0.0.1. So what this means is that if a game client is released today that uh, creates tickets with this field, it would match in this queue, in this pool. I've pre-populated this again, uh, just called it beta pool A. Uh, again, it's in the same original queue that we've created, deathmatch. Uh, but uh, what we're trying to do here is that maybe we want to create another pool called beta pool P, uh, beta pool B, sorry. And uh, what we would do is we can do A B testing. So clients would say, uh, I want to send tickets to uh, pool A or pool B, and then we can kind of subdivide and test our different um, rule logic there. Once we've created our pools, we can see our two different pools here default pool and the beta players. Uh, and you can see the beta players has filters because it's not the default pool. Um, and you can hover over here and see what type of filters we have. We've only set up one filter. And for the default pool, again, we don't need filters for that one because it serves as a fallback pool. I've quickly created another one. Uh, so now we have beta players A, beta players B, and the difference is the build version. So build version beta 0.0.1 and uh, beta 0.0.2. Uh, what would happen here is that when a ticket comes into the matchmaker, we're going to first test the filters on beta players B. If it matches, the ticket is going to go there. If it doesn't, it's going to go to A. Or I can just reorder and then I'm going to test beta players A first, the filters for beta players A first. If it matches there, we're going to go to that pool. If it doesn't, we're going to go to 
beta player is B, and then uh, default pool is our fallback if it doesn't match any of the other pools. That was a quick rundown of how we can set up a matchmaker. And this really just scratches the surface of what we can do with a matchmaker. There are lots of more options and lots of more things that you can do. Uh, I, I suggest that you guys just hop in, register, create uh, a matchmaker and, and start playing around with the rules. Look at all the possibilities that you can do. Um, I'm gonna pass it back to Gladys now uh, and take a look at what the roadmap looks like and what our next steps are. Thanks, Galau. So um, besides the easy setup, setup process we just talked about, Matchmaker is also a better tested solution. So over the past few years, we work with game studios of all sizes and help them launch to huge successes. Um, here are just a few of the many testimonials from our customers, including Respawn and Team17. Um, so for the next step, going to the next slide, we just uh, had an overview of game server hosting and matchmaker. And if you're interested in knowing more about services, stay tuned for our email after the session. From the email, you can find resources, including video guides, documentation, and also our latest multiplayer report. We'll also share um, the recording of this session as well. And we welcome you all to talk to us and join our huge developer community through our forums and our channels. You can find the links under the Get Involved session. And for the roadmap on the next slide, you can also visit our public roadmap at unity.com to find out more about the features that will come to our services. We have the QR code on the screen here, so feel free to use it. And from the roadmap, you can find a submit idea block in the um, that we welcome all the feature ideas from you. So please submit your feedback there. And um, I think that brings up to the end of the webinar today. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. So with that, let's open the floor to questions. Um, I see we already have a lot of questions coming in and some, some of our team members have answered it in the Q&A session and um, we'll allow some time to um, have more questions coming in. At the same time, I think um, there are a couple of questions that um, I will be able to answer. So I will just uh, take the liberty to answer some of the matchmaker questions. So I saw a couple of questions around if the uh, matchmaker is able to work with game hosting solution um, other than um, our Unity game server hosting solution. So right now, matchmaker requires game server hosting solution to run, but we also have the support of third-party hosting solution um, on our roadmap right now. We expect this to come sometime next year. And meanwhile, we strongly recommend you trying uh, multiplayer, the game server hosting solution plus matchmaker as the, with the free credit we provide because the, we make sure there's a streamlined process uh, when it comes to onboarding process. And also we'll have a first class support um, to help you get started with both of these solutions. I think there's also questions about matchmaker working with lobby. So we also, working with the team um, to put together some setup guide and documentation and how to set up matchmaker together with lobby. Stay tuned for that. Uh, once we have the guide ready, uh, we will send the announcement in our forums and our channels to make sure you uh, have the opportunity to check it out. Yeah, Gladys, I see a few questions here. Uh, let me give you one of the questions. Uh, thanks for the great answers. Are there any good examples on GitHub for right implementation and flow of lobby and matchmaking, right? This this kind of fits within what you, what you were just talking about? Yep, that's right. Uh, we probably won't have it in GitHub, but we'll have it available in other resources like documentation, blog, and quick start, guide, et cetera. And I think another question that came in was, is it possible to use the matchmaker system linked to a private AWS server, or is it required to connect through multiplayer Unity hosting services? Yeah, I think um, that also goes back to um, our answer on uh, whether we'll have support um, on third-party hosting solution. We have this on our roadmap, and we expect this 
to come sometime next year. We don't have a lot of information to share right now, but stay tuned because uh, we definitely have this plan. See a question here. How does hotfix using data work? For example, if I wanted to update a data value from one to three, uh, I'm assuming that this question is re referring to uh, how we set up pools and how we set up our queue. And let's say, for example, there's a data coming in or a data field coming in a ticket. Uh, and if we want to act on this or not. Uh, with, with the matchmaker, when you set up a, a queue, you can uh, you can say, for example, a queue for a specific version or a queue for a specific game mode, and then you can use pools as well. With the filters, you can dynamically change the filters and it would have directly affect the, how the live game works. But there's also environments where uh, you can create an environment in the matchmaker and then multiplay, and then all of the environments would link through them. Uh, so that if, if you want to test a development build or a development value, uh, then this would not affect the live game. Uh, not sure if that completely answers the question. Uh, feel free to just type the question again uh, if that doesn't fully answer that. I see a few uh, multiplayer related questions coming in, so I can uh, answer a few of those if we like. So I've seen uh, a couple of instances of questions around maximum player numbers uh, with uh, with multiplayer services and uh, netcode. So. I think as a good answer on that one, the, the demo I showed you earlier on was showed off the BR200 um, sample game. So out of the box on multiplayer, that will be able to handle uh, 80 players per game session. So that's uh, available now if you, if you were to go and upload that sample game to multiplayer and try and run those servers. That's been benchmarked at 80 players. Um, if you put some more powerful hardware behind that, you can get that up to 200 players. And when I say more powerful hardware, that's something that's not available on the on the entry level tier. But if you were to work with multi, with the support process, you could get more powerful hardware added to that fleet to be able to to run up to two hundred players. Ultimately, the multiplayer platform itself isn't so concerned about players per match. It's it's really about the hardware grunts you can put behind the the server, the game server itself. Is two hundred players in a battle royale, highly competitive game? You need a lot of processing power to run that. In terms of the netcode side of things, that sample game is, is based on Photon Fusion, so it's uh, it's not using um, NGO or, or Dots Netcode, for example. So those projects uh, are, you know, we're still continuing to invest in those, um, but the the BR two hundred is really just a a collaboration to to demonstrate you can have that kind of high player count off the off the bat with uh, multiplayer services. My advice would be that. Your mileage will vary with NGO or, or dot .NET code, depending on the type of game, how much data you're pushing over the wire. So uh, my, my advice would be jump over to the Unity forum, um, have a chat with um, with the group there. And um, us as Unity developers, we're in that forum as well. So we can jump in and help you with some more specific questions there would be my advice on that one. Uh, in terms of other questions on the multiplayer side. Yeah, I think there is one about are the multiplayer servers scalable? Does it cater for a sudden rise in player count? Sure, 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 sure. I didn't see that question come in, but um, yeah, ultimately, absolutely scalable. So the the way that the uh, multiplayer system works is it's driven by uh, a push from a matchmaker, effectively, or a push from your scaling settings. So multiplayer is designed to scale up and down based on your player demand. So what you'll generally see is a bit of a circadian rhythm. So across the course of a day, your player count is going to trend upward. Once you reach your peak in a given region, and then it's going to trend down again as people go to bed and stop playing the game, ultimately. So multiplayer will scale up with more servers as matchmakers are saying, I need more matches, I need more matches. You'll get more servers online, more machines online, and then it will drain those away again once they become unused. And that's really what I was hinting at with the availability buffer or the minimum servers, maximum servers earlier. So you want enough minimum servers available to stay ahead of your scaling rate effectively. So imagine as you're curving up with your number of players, you want your availability of servers to be curving up slightly ahead of it and slightly below it as, as you scale back down again. So that's what your availability buffer is for there, ultimately. Uh, I see another question of, it would seem that our game server, it would seem our game server we are working on would do well using the game server and using Relay. Most of our game is not competitive, so would Matchmaker still be a good choice? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question, Jeremy. Um, I think on that one, there's, 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 it's hard to give a clear cut answer. Ultimately, it really depends on what your sort of game mode is at that point. If it's not so much a session based game, if it's not a, 
match start, match end, you know, sort of a self-contained short-lived session. Something like matchmaking may not be a good choice for you. It may be it's it's a slower game, it's turn-based, your data rate is lower, so you might a drop in, drop out with relay might be more of an interesting or a more viable solution for you. Again, my advice would be Unity Forum's a great place for this stuff. Jump over there, have a conversation with us in a bit more detail to learn more about your game mode, uh, and then we can sort of give a better answer than we've got time to really dig into today. But um, they're both good solutions, ultimately, but it um, really depends on what type of game you're building. Yeah, and then if I may add, I mean, with, with yeah. Matchmaker, you really get lots of control over how you want your players to, to, to join together, even if it's a 1v1, 2v2 kind of scenario. Uh, you can you can really say I I don't want a new player to play with a very experienced player by setting some rules on your skill. Uh, you can't do that without matchmaker. Um, so uh, it, again, to, to reiterate on what Dan was saying, it really depends on how uh, your game uh, logic works and how you want to set up your game and if it's competitive or not competitive, right? Yeah. Thanks, Glow. Uh, and couple more. I, I Sorry, see guys. one here about geolocation and rules, uh, and uh, I, I think we kind of answered something or mentioned something very similar to this, so I'll, I'll, I'll just go ahead with that one. Uh, so the, the question says, how do you create rules for something like similar geolocation? Uh, what we want to do in, in the matchmaker when you're creating rules is you can, uh, again, you have a field called quest results, which is quality of service results, and what you do is that uh, a game client would test its connection with the different regions uh, on your multiplayer fleet, and then it would report the results as ping and latency uh, and uh, packet loss. Uh, these results would then go into your ticket, and the matchmaker can have some rules set up on these class results. So, so the matchmaker can then say, I only want to put players together in this team or in this match when there's a difference between latency that is less than 50 or when the maximum latency is 100, right? Latency doesn't exceed 150. So what the matchmaker would do is that it would make sure that uh, these players would always join in regions that have very uh, low ping. Uh, it doesn't check the, the location. Uh, the, there are no rules on the, the um, let's say, region ID itself, but you have rules on the results. So what you can do if a player doesn't want to play with someone in, let's say, North America, and they want to play in Europe, is they would not put the, the quest results for the North America uh, uh, regions in their ticket and only put in the, the quest results for the Europe uh, region. That way they can kind of control which regions they want to try and find a match in. I see there's a questions about matchmaker. Will matchmaker ever be put up so we can eliminate pulling? So the answer is yes, we have this on the roadmap. And um, if I understand correctly uh, by pops up I assume you mean um, having the persistent connection support on matchmaker um, so we have this on roadmap we want to deliver it sometime next year and I will strongly recommend you to go to um, the roadmap of matchmaker um, click the submit idea block so you can submit this as a fe feature request because we will love to know more about your specific use case uh, just before we finish up, I do see a, quite a few questions coming in around uh, pricing and the, the free credit system as well. Best thing to do to get some more detail on that would be to jump over to docs.unity.com, navigate into the game server hosting section and have a look at the pricing page. Because within that pricing page, we've got a full breakdown there into how the credits work, the amount you're going to get, the time scale, and also importantly, how we calculate your ultimate costs. Um, for running your game server. So that should give you a much better idea of, of how much it is going to cost to run that server, how quickly you'll eat up the, the credits um, and you know how to model that a bit more, let's say, relevantly to the type of game that you're going to be building. So that would be my, my ultimate advice on, on the pricing side of things. A couple of other quick multiplayer questions. Uh, uh, Joel's asking, as the systems are container-based, will it be possible to include private dedicated hardware to be used by the fleet? Um, yeah, it's a good question, Joel. Um, so ultimately, when you're creating a fleet of multiplayer, the machines that run your game servers are always dedicated to you. So we don't multi-tenant game servers from different users on the same underlying virtual machines or the same 
uh, hardware, let's say. So yes, the servers are container-based, but that's not for multi-tenancy, let's say. That is for um, portability, ease of use, security, isolation, those kind of things. So that ultimately, the underlying hardware is still dedicated to you, or the underlying virtual machines are still dedicated to you. I see a question about, uh, is it possible, or is there documentation how to create a ticket for a group of players or friends who wants to play together in a team? Uh, I, I quickly touched point on this earlier, uh, but what you want to do is that if, if you have a, a group of players that want to play together, you would have a lobby, ideally, that would group them together, and then the lobby owner would create a ticket on behalf of all the players in the in the lobby. And what this would look like is in your ticket request uh, or the, the lobby owner's ticket request, it would include a list of players. And we have uh, on the matchmaking documentation, there is a uh, section uh, called ticket samples, and it has how to create a ticket, like a sample of how to create a ticket, a code snippet of how to create a ticket. This says var players, new list of players, and then you start adding new player, new player, new player. So what the lobby owner would do is that you would add as many players as you want in the ticket, and then you'd submit the ticket using the NTSDK. That way, the matchmaker would always make sure that all the players that were submit that were submit inside the ticket would end up on the same team on the same match. Uh, matchmaker would not split up the the players on a ticket and onto different teams. Okay, so we still see um, some open questions, but. Um, um, I think uh, that will be our last questions um, due to the time lapse. So if you still have any questions you'd like to know more um, about services, please stay tuned for the email and also go to um, our community and, and forum um, to ask your questions. Uh, we'll make sure we have um, the people here to help you out. Thank you for attending this event. We look forward to supporting your multiplayer projects. We hope to see you all very soon. Thank you, folks. Good to have you with us today. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye.